Chapter 16 The Glory of the Lord Leviticus 9, 1-24 And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto Aaron, Take thee a young calf for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And unto the children of Israel thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a kid of the goats for a sin offering, and a calf, and a lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering. Also a bullock and a ram for peace offerings, to sacrifice before the Lord, and a meat offering mingled with oil, for today the Lord will appear unto you. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded that ye should do, and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar, and offer thy sin offering, and thy burnt offering, and make an atonement for thyself and for the people, and offer the offering of the people, and make an atonement for them, as the Lord commanded. Aaron therefore went unto the altar, and slew the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood unto him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and put it upon the horns of the altar, and poured out the blood at the bottom of the altar. But the fat and the kidneys and the call above the liver of the sin offering he burnt upon the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the flesh and the hide he burnt with fire without the camp, and he slew the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled round about upon the altar. And they presented the burnt offering unto him with the pieces thereof, and the head, and he burnt them upon the altar. And he did wash the innards and the legs, and burnt them upon the burnt offering on the altar. And he brought the people's offerings, and took the goats, which was the sin offering for the people, and slew it, and offer it for sin as the first. And he brought the burnt offering, and offered it according to the manner. And he brought the meat offering, and took an handful thereof, and burnt it upon the altar, beside the burnt sacrifice of the morning. He slew also the bullock and the ram for a sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people, and Aaron's sons presented unto him the blood, which he sprinkled upon the altar round about. And the fat of the bullock and of the ram, the rump, and that which covereth the innards, and the kidneys, and the call above the liver. And he put the fats upon the breasts, and he burnt the fat upon the altar. And the breasts and the right shoulder Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord, as Moses commanded. And Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people, and blessed them, and came down from offering of the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation, and came out, and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord, and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which, when all the people saw, they shouted, and fell on their faces. Leviticus 9, 1-24 in this chapter we have the installation of the priests, the atonement of the congregation, and the blessing of God. In verse 1 we have a reference to the elders of Israel. In verse 3 to the children of Israel, that is, the covenant group, Israel. Apart from that, the references are to the people, verses 7, 9, 13, 15, 18, 22 to 24. And in some of these verses, the word people, am, is used twice. They are not called Hebrews in this context. A racially mixed multitude, Exodus 12, 38, that is, a large number of foreigners had left Egypt with the Hebrews. All are present here. As all these peoples stand before the Lord, they are only identified in terms of him as his congregation or people. 
We are not told what percentage of Israel was at this time Hebrew. We do know that Abraham, in his rescue of Lot, commanded 318 men from his own household. These were the fighting men, with the elderly and the young males remaining with women and female children and the herds. This gives us about 1,000 males in Abraham's household, and as this group continued and was united later with Isaac and Jacob and their establishments, only two males out of 1,000, Abraham and Isaac, were of Abrahamic blood. Israel, with those of Hebraic blood increasing, while a large mixed multitude was added to the various tribes, was from the beginning a religious congregation, a church not a race. This is still true of the Jews. We have here first the sin offering, verses 1 to 3. Part of this offering was burned on the altar, but the flesh and hide outside the camp, verses 8 to 11. As Scott noted, the priests ate the sin offering of the people as typically bearing their iniquity, but they could not bear their own sin and therefore they ate no part of any sin offerings sacrificed for themselves, but the whole was carried forth out of the camp, as taken quite away by Christ, the great antitype. There was no approach to God without atonements, and hence the necessity of the sacrifices, the priesthood and the altar and the tabernacle, as the meeting place between God and man. The sacrifices stressed the price of sin, and more... Many years ago, a doctor in the Deep South told me of his early practice in a clinic dealing with victims of violence and venereal disease. He remarked wryly that it deglamorized sin for him and made it clear that sin is a messy business. The bloody sacrifices emphasize this truth. Sin is an ugly fact which has as its final consequence the judgment of death. Sin has no pretty conclusion. Seconds we have the burnt offerings, verses 12 to 16, in which all was consumed on the altar. This sent forth the requirements of total dedication by the believer. There is a grim historical fact here. In verse 2, Aaron is required to sacrifice for his atonement an unblemished male calf. The people's sin offering was a goat, verse 15. In Exodus 32, Aaron had taken part in the worship of a golden bull calf, and now for atonement he must sacrifice a living one. Then, in the burnt offering, he set forth the requirements of total obedience and dedication, God's requirements of himself and of all. There can be no private reservations or corners where God could neither enter nor reign in any man's life. Third, There followed, in logical order, the meal offering, verse 17, which meant the dedication of one's work and production to God. The burnt offering was the dedication of one's life and person, the meal offering of his work. Fourth, the peace offering, verses 18 to 21, celebrated the communion now established between God and his covenant people. The peace offering was concluded by the blessing pronounced by Aaron, apparently that which was set down in Numbers 6, 24-26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Now came fire from heaven as well as the glory of the Lord, which appeared unto all the people, verses 23 and 24. The same fire from heaven set forth God's acceptance of the sacrifices of Gideon, Judges 6, 20 and 21, Elijah, 1 Kings 18, 38, and of Solomon at the dedication of the temple, 2 Chronicles 7, 1 and 2. It was believed by the rabbis that this fire from heaven was kept alive on the altar until the building of Solomon's temple, when it fell afresh. Its history thereafter is less certain, given the periods of neglect. According to Porter, In the Old Testament, the word glory 
almost always means the visible appearance of wealth and splendor which indicates a man's importance. God's glory had already been seen as a fiery cloud, Exodus 16.10, 24.15-17. One can say that God's glory also appeared against Egypt as a series of plagues which destroyed it. We cannot separate God's glory from his nature and being. Hence, where God manifests his glory, we see deliverance and blessing on the one hand, and judgment and death on the other. Hence, as soon as the people are reconciled to God, God's blessings are poured out on them. The great appearance of God's glory is to come with Christ's second advent. It follows thus that Christ's return is also the last judgment. It is the full expression of both his covenant law and judgments, and also of his grace and deliverance. It is an ugly fact that premillennialism has partially separated the return of Christ, the rapture, from the last judgment, because the two are inseparable. The glory of God, fully unveiled and revealed, cannot be a secret event, nor a harmless one. Amos, in his day, saw the folly of antinomian expectations. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord! To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Amos 5, 18-20 Gideon had better sense. When he saw on a limited basis the glory of the Lord in the appearance of The angel of the Lord, he, knowing himself to be a sinner, feared that he would die. Judges 6, 19-23 Jerusalem saw God the Son in his incarnation, rejected him, and perished. Those who look to the any-moment return of Christ in order to be raptured out of the world's sin and grief are asking for their damnation. Christ's Great Commission Matthew 28, 18-20, is a mandate for work, not escape 